Our final presentation uh, this morning will be by Dr. Uh, Elaine Lee from UT Austin. She's an associate professor in the Department of Physics of the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on the interaction of light and matter at the nanoscale in quantum materials. Her innovative work has helped create and control materials that can emit one photon at a time. The creation and manipulation of these materials could open the door to major advances in energy, communications, and computing. Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you our work. Uh, today I'm gonna um, tell you a few examples of a project we pursue in my laboratory and cast it in a framework of how can it uh, take us to the next generation of information technology based on quantum physics. Okay, so let's uh, first of all review what are the key components of information technology. So first, uh, you need to store information. We know uh, information is stored in binary form. In today's technology, they're stored in magnetic films where the orientation of these little domains, oh, sorry, uh, the orientations of these little domains represent information. If they point in one direction, let's say to the right, they represent one. If they point to the left, they represent zero. Okay, the second component is that you need to process those information. And it turns out the most uh, basic element for any information processing device is called a transistor. So a transistor is essentially an on and off switch. The first transistors made in the Bell Lab in the 40s look like this. I keep uh, confusing the, the laser pointer. They look like this. They look like a little bit of a longhorn uh, you know, symbol there. Um, my apologies if, uh, if you're Aggie. And there, there, are, million, uh, there are billions of them in a the, in the chip like this today. And, um, and then what you need to do using these switches to, is to construct gate. In fact, you only need two type of gates, a single, get, a single bit gate where you flip zero to one and one to zero, and a two bit gate. And here's an example of a two-bit gate. So you, ha you have two inputs. Oh, sorry. I keep uh, got to learn this. Uh, so here's a two-bit gate. You have A and B input. This is what we call the AND gate. <coughs> Only when both A and B is one, you would have an output of one. Otherwise, you always have an output of zero. So you only need to take these switch switches and make either a one-bit gate or two-bit gate. With those, you can process any information you want. Okay? And then the next uh, step in the information technology is that you need to transfer that information. And today, information transfer is largely done by using optical fibers. And you can find light in basically a two cladding of glasses. And then the glass, uh, this fiber will confine uh, the light just like <coughs> water pipe confines water. And then you construct these uh, huge uh, uh, fiber networks across the oceans to transmit information. That's the uh, bulk of the information transfer is done. And what we want to ask is that can we take a quantum leap of these technologies? And we, want, we ask these questions, and what are the smallest objects that we can use to store information? And how do we communicate in information using the smallest amount of light? Can we use single photons, for example? And uh, what, are the, what are the smallest dimension uh, of physical devices we can use to make logic gates reliably? And if they are quantum or they have some statistical property, how do we work with that? And then uh, we want to ask the question on what time scale you can actually manipulate these electrons. So before I go on, uh, let me define what is small and what is fast for us in the, in, in the laboratory. So when we say quantum materials, we're really talking about how do we reduce the dimension so we can control where the electrons go. So naturally, you take what we call the 3D, sorry, you take what's what we call the three-dimensional materials, and uh, electrons are free to move in all three dimensions. And if you can learn to sandwich materials and then put different materials together, you may be able to confine the motion of electron in a two-dimensional plane. And that ha has already given you a lot of advantage in constructing transistors uh, with faster speed, for example. And then you can further confine the dimensions and make them move in one dimensional line. 
or just confine them in a tiny box, and that's called quantum dot. And actually, as I learned at this meeting, uh, Dr. Jordan, uh, Dr. Warren used these kind of quantum dots to show the, to, um, to um, get those images that he showed you in his movies that are earlier in the day. So what are we doing is really by confining the motion electron, we're changing what's called the band structure or allowed energy levels that the, these electrons can, can go in materials. Once you change the band structure, you change all property of this material. You can change most dramatically the emitting light colors and the statistics, you know, how, uh, how the photons come out of these materials. And in this case, the size really matters. You take a rubber ball, you make it smaller, it's still a rubber ball. But if you can confine the motion electron down to a few nanometer, and then you can really tune their colors. And this is a very commonly used picture to show that, you know, by changing the, quantum, uh, the size of the quantum dot, for, for, uh, from, for example, six nanometer to three nanometer, you can tune a color uh, through this rainbow range of colors. And that's because you already changed the energy level the electrons are allowed to occupy. So this is what we call quantum engineering, and uh, controlling quantum materials. Okay, and then how do we uh, see these electrons? How do we manipulate them? And just from daily experiences, to see a fast process, you need a faster camera. And here are some uh, examples of the images that are captured using uh, fast ca uh, cameras with just a shutter speed on the order of a few microseconds. And they're amazing. Here's a, a bullet shooting through a tomato. Here's a drop of milk falling into a glass. And by this time scale, milliseconds is still way too slow for to watch electrons in the materials. So what we use is uh, a uh, series of ultra-fast laser pulses and the duration of these ultra-fast laser pulses are described in units of femtosecond and attosecond. So one femtosecond is the 10 to the minus 15 second. And I'd like to give you some sense of how fast that is by giving you some ratios. Uh, so for example, what is the ratio between one second and one femtosecond? Let me put it in, in time. In a daily language, when we say it happens in a heartbeat, a heartbeat happens on the order of a second. And then that one second to one femtosecond is really uh, the age of the dinosaur, which is 65 million years ago, over a second. That same ratio is a second over a femtosecond. And that's also the ratio between the distance between the Earth and the sun and divided by the width of the ants. So that same ratio is also 10 to the 15. So in a laboratory, we use uh, ultra-short laser pulses with duration about 100 femtoseconds and we watch how electron move. Actually, this ultra-fast process is quite common. Uh, it happens in biological systems. The process of, of a blood cell uptaking uh, oxygen happened on femtosecond time scale. The process of chemical reaction, the, the breaking and the formation of chem chemical bound happened on that time scale, and we just choose to apply these tools to study how electrons move in materials. Okay, so now let me give you one particular example, one type of material that we've been working with, and uh, that, that's really only a, on a level of atomically thin uh, thickness, and they can have implications for future uh, information processing technology. So uh, this, a uh, uh, lot of people in my field in physics or material science or convex matter physics are obsessed with studying atomically thin materials. It turns out, and there's the, this very influential article came out uh, around 2005, and they show by using scotch tape that you can actually isolate one monolayer thick materials, and you can isolate many different kind of material, and they can be semiconductor, they can be metal, they can be superconductor. So, and that gives us a, a, a easy access to a wide range of material. We can also put them together and see how they act when you stack them together. And the, the folks that first did this pretty low-tech way of producing quantum materials uh, get recognized just a few years later by Nobel Prize. And, and then in the, in the language of quantum material, this is two-dimensional quantum material, and it's as thin as it gets, because it's only one atom thick or three atom thick, depends on the unit cell. And what's amazing is that two layer is, is truly different from a single layer. Okay, so let me tell you why is it possible to use scotch tape to peel them off. And that's because these materials have very strong 
in plane bonding, and they bond it by covalence bond or ionic bond. But between different unit cells in the thickness direction, they're only bounded by weak Van der Waals force. So it is possible to take a scotch tape and start with the bulk material and create a, just a single layer or three atom thick uh, unit cell of material. And they have uh, various symmetry properties. A lot of them come in this form of a, a, a honeycomb lattice. And they have threefold symmetry that have important impl implications for, for their physical properties. <laughs> OK, so uh, we do this low tech of scotch tape. I have an army of undergraduate research researchers that have really mastered the skill of creating them. Uh, but uh, smart, smarter material scientists like uh, Delia, they would, uh, they would use a more sophisticated tool like chemical vapor deposition. And these are a little bit outdated images. They can all be much larger than what, what I'm showing you now. And here's one of the early work that showed even when you just peel off, this is the light emission coming from the material, the green light. A good, the green light represents emission coming from two layers of material, but just when you peel the one more layer off, they all of a sudden become very bright light emitters. And that's again because we actually change the band structure and where the electron is allowed to occupy and changes their optical property dramatically. OK, so then uh, what really is responsible light for light emission is not a single electron, but what we call the electron hole pair. Uh, what's interesting is that in a three-dimensional material, these electron hole pair, they have coolant forces and that are screened by other atoms around them. But when you thin down the material to just a, a one uh, atomic or three atom thick, these electric field uh, actually gets out of the material, gets into the vacuum. That leads to new properties, and that, uh, for example, they lead to a whole new zoo of different what we call quasi-particles that give, to, give rise to new light-emitting properties. And then uh, when you, if you're a spectroscopist like myself, and you look at the, these emission line, you ask two questions. You first of you ask, where do they emit light? And secondly, you ask, what is the line width? How broad it is? And it turns out in simple experiment, you're not really intri probing intrinsic property of a single electron hole pair. What you're doing is when you look at a, a, a host of them, for example, south of them, you see this uh, very broad line shape that we call inhomogeneous broadening. If you were able to isolate a single electron hole pair, the line width would be much narrower, and that's what we call homogeneous broadening. And it turns out it's related to quantum dynamics of the electron in this material. Uh, if you will, you can use the simplest model. You can treat them as a two-level system. And then how fast the electron pop from, how fast the electron pop from the excited state to the ground state is determined by what's called the, uh, the population relaxation time, or we call it T1 time. And, but the phase coherence that's encoded in, in the electron is actually called uh, the T2 time. And this T2 time, is, in fact, is directly related to the line width of one of this single electron hole pair. And that's an information that we want to uh, understand so we can use these things for quantum information processing, for example, that I'll explain a little more uh, shortly. It turns out getting this information is very difficult. We actually have to construct rather uh, complex experiment using ma many laser pulses. And uh, I, I won't bore you with the detail, but just show you the schematics of type of experiment that we do. And let me indulge myself and show you a, a actual data. But let me tell you what this data tells you. So we are plotting this data in the energy domain. But if we uh, convert them using Fourier transform, it tells us this, that the, not, the dynamics of it, these electrons are happening on the order of a, a 100, 200 femtoseconds. And that tells us if we want to control their dynamics, we need to come in with laser pulses that are shorter than that. And that tool is actually available today to us in the laboratory. So we can do that. And they also tell us where we can look for photon emission that we call entangled photon, a pair of photons that have some mysterious relation between them that, again, can be used for secure information uh, communication. OK, so why do we study these materials? And they can be used for flexible devices. You know, the, uh, the electronics of the future is not going to be confined on your table, in your laptop, in your cell phone. They can be, uh, be wear on the skin. They can be painted on a wall. And they can be put in fabrics. And you will wear them on your clothes. <laughs> and then uh, they, uh, these materials have already been shown that you can use them to build very small channel lens transistors. Again, that on and off switch, that's the, 
basic unit cell for any information processing devices. And finally, um, my uh, passion is really about uh, study how they generate light, and they can be used to generate um, individual photons one at a time, or pairs of photons that have uh, mysterious uh, connections between them. Okay, so let me now switch gear and tell you a little bit what we're doing in terms of uh, in, in the field of information transfer. And that has some relation to the topic that Delia was just telling you about. What can we use nanoparticle for manipula uh, manipulating light at a nanoscale? So uh, we've been using nanoparticles, particularly metallic nanoparticles, for a long time. And they're responsible for the, uh, for the bright, bright colors in the church windows, for example. And um, they, people make them in solutions these days in large quantity that can be probably used for, uh, you know, in the future, uh, smart windows like Delia was telling you about. But for physicists who want to understand their most basic properties, one of the problems that, for samples made in the solution, is they're, they're still heterogeneous. It's possible to have few particles cl uh, clustered together. And because their plasmatic resonance that Delia was just telling you about, two particles actually act quite differently from a single particle. So we needed a, a better control tool so what we did in the laboratory is we actually uh, used uh, atomic force <coughs> microscope and we used the tip as a robotic arm. We pushed this particle into a particular configuration and create a property that, they, they that we want to study. And here are some examples. By putting particle of two different shapes, we can actually functionalize a molecule, for example, with two different particles with different shape and tell the orientation of the molecule, how they're changing in real time. We can construct four particles and have them uh, essentially uh, induce what we call a matter molecule that give you the smallest current loop and give rise to a magnetic field on a very small uh, land scale. And the most simplest hybrid molecule, if you will, uh, consists of a semiconductor quantum dot, which is a good light emitter, and a gold particle, a plasmatic nanoparticle. And it turns out the plasmatic particle can effectively control the light time or, or when the light coming out of the quantum dot. And here's another example that we can actually, these quantum dots would emit light one photon at a time. We can use the uh, plasmatic particle as antenna and broadcast their light emissions. And this experiment really done a couple years ago uh, should, not even, should not even work. But when you put a dedicated student uh, who's desperate to graduate and they make it work. So to truly understand it, you actually need to understand the quantum property uh, of it. So, um, so I'll, uh, I, I'm watching the time, I'm running short, so I'll just uh, skip the details. But coarsely speaking, this very tiny five, five nanometer quantum particle actually can polarize the, the gold nanoparticle and make them act as antenna effectively at particular wavelengths. Okay, so why before I close this section, I want to tell uh, this part, I want to tell you why single photon sources are useful. So in the future, communication will be done through both classical channels and quantum channels. We're not going to do all of our communication through quantum channel, but we'll be uh, saving them for um, the most critical part, for example, uh, key, quantum key distribution. So all your information need to be encrypted to protect it, to prevent uh, um, basically interception. And if you send that information, one photon at a time, and a single photon can no, long, no longer be split. If there's anyone who's trying to intercept the information, you'll find out because you'll be missing a photon. So uh, because of that, we can use quantum information uh, or single photon source for, uh, for secure information uh, uh, communication. Okay, so the last bit of it, I want to tell you a little bit about information storage. So here's a review how storage technology has evolved. And this is, uh, you can, if you know uh, some of this technology uh, that kind of review your age a little bit. And back in the 50s, uh, even few megabytes, you have towels, you have a cabinet to store that information. And today you walk into Costco for $70 cheaper than the pair of prescription glasses, you get a terabyte of information storage media. So we come, uh, come, along a long, come, uh, come a long way and, and now this information bit, this is uh, only a f a, about 10 nanometer in size. When you keep shrinking them, you're started, you start to worry about uh, stability. What if and the, the thermal energy is possible to flip them in the wrong direction? 
You know, you don't want your bank account to flip in the wrong direction. And here is the, the, the storage media that we deliver annually, and it started to saturate. And we know the demands are keep increasing. We're making more and more home videos that need to be stored um, by Facebook, and these companies actually pay a lot of money to, uh, to have information storage centers. You know, so in a way, we need to find new technology to store information of the future. Uh, so as um, researcher working on fundamental science, we're thinking about some very exotic ideas. And let me just highlight the second one that we call uh, skirmion. So it's like, uh, it's a special spin texture. Think about this as hair that you cannot never comb properly. And you know, the hair, this are just pointing all outward and this has kind of swirling a chiral uh, structure. And we want to code information in the spin structures and they have special topology. Topology is a very robust property. For example, uh, think about giving you a Play-Doh. Uh, you can shape it any way you want. The only thing you cannot do is you cannot punch a hole. So if that's the constraint, you cannot deform an apple, uh, you cannot deform an apple to a donut because one has a hole. Topology is about how points in space are connected. But what you can do is to convert a donut into a coffee mug. So think about that, because they only, both of them only have one hole. So that's possible. Using these kind of feature, and these uh, skirmia have different topologies. As a result, they're robust. So that's the idea we're in, uh, uh, playing with, us and other people are playing with about <coughs> how do we store information in the future. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, this, this object is called skirmion, named after actually physicists in nuclear physics, uh, in nuclear physics field back in the 60s. And just within a few years, the field has gone through a lot of development. Um, back a few years ago, you can publish a science article by creating this individual skirmion using a very specialized uh, instrument taught, uh, called the scanning uh, STM or scanning tip microscopy. And then you can blow what's called the skirmion bubble you pass current through these constraints, you have these bubbles. But now, just two to three years later, we have learned how to create them just using a current. And we can make these little skirmions run in the racetrack in their little bubbles. And they become a lot you know, promising for, for information storage technology. Uh, so I, I'll spare you with the equations, but as physicists, we, we actually try to understand what are the most fundamental interactions between the spin that allow you to create the skirmions. And I, and I have to, uh, before I end my talk, I feel like I need to come clean and confess that I don't think about application on a daily basis. We think about more fundamental questions uh, as those identified in a report like this. What are the grand challenges you need to solve for science and, and engineering so that we can provide um, um, the technology for sustain, sustain, sustainable development and the question, the grand challenges identified in such a report compiled by DOE uh, include how do we control material property at the level of electrons? As I said, you know, how small, what are the small, uh, most small bit of material can use? And what are the smallest devices? And how fast these electrons are moving and, and going through that, 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 that dynamic? And then we want to always want to work with the newest materials that are designed and perfected at the atomic level. And there are many pieces uh, to the puzzle to solve these grand challenges. Actually, my groups and others are working on uh, you know, a lot of these related areas. And I want to leave you with one, this, this piece of information, uh, take home message. Whoever controls the materials controls the future for the simple reason that everything is made of something. If you want, to make, if you, you want a better device, you have to start with better material. And a very, I'm very excited to share with you that we at UT Austin, we just got funded by NSF for a six, six year uh, collaborative research center that's called the um, uh, Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, uh, or in short, MERSEC. This is actually the first MERSEC that we managed to secure in the state of Texas in decades. And then within that umbrella, people like uh, Delia and myself will be collaborating. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Lee? Ah. Yes. 
No? Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters and, and the audience uh, for, for these presentations. Um, nominations for the 2019 O'Donnell Awards, all four, will be accepted beginning in February. Information will be sent to all conference attendees, um, and you can also stay up to date by subscribing to the TAMIS newsletter at TAMIS.org. Uh, the morning section will continue after a short break. Uh, I don't know whether we have apples and donuts out there, but I think we have coffee cups. And, and I think they stay coffee cups. They don't change when you pour the coffee in them. Uh, we'll convene uh, at 10.15 for the next panel discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>